Hey guys, it's Kylie. It's uh, it's kind of been a while since I made a video about Legend of Korra or actually wrote any kind of in-depth analysis, with the exception being my updated analysis of Asami's wardrobe, which I'll link there. Uh, and I, f I feel bad about that. There is other stuff in the pipeline. I've just been kind of busy and a little distracted. However, yesterday I received an ask to my Tumblr uh, that linked me the video Avatar The Last Airbender Handling the Power Crawl. And the ask specifically wanted me to say, how would I address this criticism of Legend of Korra? And just to quickly sum up what this video is, and this video wasn't like super negative. It was actually more praise for Avatar The Last Airbender than it was criticism for Legend of Korra, but there was criticism for Legend of Korra. I was, and, you know, I really liked a lot of the things talked about, but when it's referred to the power crawl, what it means is in any kind of action TV show, there's a natural trajectory of how power develops with character, um, with our protagonists gaining more and more skills. So in Avatar The Last Airbender, that was kind of like, you know, the Avatar state was that ultimate godlike power that Aang didn't have full control of at all until the very end. You know, remember the end of book one, he went into it, but it kind of haunted him. He wasn't, you know, able to tap into it himself. Likewise, lightning bending, Zuko never mastered it. He just did the redirect thing. And that wasn't really until book three when I think he redirected his father's lightning um, in that one scene that you can really say he had a great handle on it. Um, and then, you know, even other things like when metal bending got introduced, it still didn't completely break everything because there wasn't that much metal. Uh, with all of that yada yada yada. The guy also talks about how the antagonists and the protagonists sort of developed together, uh, which uh, meant that they were equally matched. And sort of, I mean, Azula didn't really develop, but she was pretty equally matched, at least to Katara. And, uh, you know, the, those she was the more direct antagonist, and Ozai, who's kind of the OP antagonist, was sort of kept out of everything. And he was really only OP, I think, because of that comet. I don't even think he is like a godlike fighter. He was good. He was a good firebender. Of course he was a good firebender. Uh, yeah. And then it goes on to say, hey, Legend of Korra did this poorly. Um, you know, giving examples such as the Avatar State booster rocket thing, or the fact that Korra astral projects and gets the power of these huge gods at the end of book two. Uh, you know, when she started out the series, all she was doing, she just lacked airbending. So she was super, super powerful from the beginning. Or like, lightning bending, Mako always had control of it, but he only used it a couple of times to like, defeat Minghua or to defeat Amon because he got that stupid breath in. Uh, so anyway, I think that's like, a valid point. But I wanted, I was starting to type out what my response to that kind of criticism is, because to me, it's sort of missing the forest for the trees in terms of what Legend of Korra does. However, as I got a little further typing it, uh, it it just was snowballing and I, I thought a video might be easier, which is good because it means I actually have notes for what I'm talking about. And that is a sight not often seen, or at least a scene not often cited. So uh, off the bat, I, I do want to say, and I, I think I've talked about this before, that as an art form, as a piece of writing, in terms of like a hero's journey or just a set show, Avatar The Last Airbender is better constructed. It had a solid arc that they had already planned out. It had a very set trajectory. Uh, I think things took form more and more as they got into the writer's room, the way Zuko's redemption arc would take place, probably definitely the trajectory that Azula was on. I'm not sure she, they ever would have foreseen her being like that tragic downfall where you're like, oh, wow, this is, you know, it, it, maybe they originally intended her to be more of like a, we're going to take her down and it will be a fist pumping moment, whatever. Um, and obviously other things developed along the way, too. But it was pretty set and pretty tight. It was the story of Aang mastering the elements, and then X time is when he had to defeat the Fire Lord. And it's a very external journey. It's why, you know, we've got Katara as the narrator. It follows the trajectory of the hero's monomyth pretty uh, intimately, although his mentor, Monk Yatso, I guess died sort of before... Uh, before things and 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 there's interesting subversions in there too, especially with like how Zuko's arc sort of winds into it. And I've always felt that it's a better constructed show. Korra is spotty, really spotty. Book two is in some ways like a dumpster fire. 
but it's a beautiful dumpster fire and I find it fascinating to break down and it's actually one of my favorite seasons to deconstruct. Actually, I'm going to link uh, book two deliberately deconstructed by Becca Toria, which is this fantastic breakdown of like how sort of transgressive that season ended up being because Bright basically took what they wrote and smashed it. However, Legend of Korra, I wouldn't call an external journey at all. Like, Korra does have a spiritual development, but it's more internal. It's more a journey of self-discovery. It's of finding her place in the world where all she wanted to do was like be the avatar. She was over-eager, right? All that stuff. And she was over-eager in her world telling her, we don't want you. So she went through a whole lot of shit and a whole lot of brutalization when you get down to it. And she ended up sort of, you know, it was through her own healing arc and her internal journey that she found a way that she could settle into this world and feel like herself and what that meant uh, for her and what that balance was for how she was able to be. And that's why book four, Korra, especially in those final few episodes after she talks to Zaheer, the like way her mind is, and she's still super proactive and super like, I'm going to dive in front of this beam, but she's like at peace. You can tell. <laughs> and she's kind of settled down. And I think, I think that's the meaning of it. So the power level, in my opinion, to Legend of Korra is completely secondary. You know, it, there's fighting to support it, but Korra's mission was never anything external. It was never mastering this and becoming the best avatar she's meant to be. And what's actually funny is that in this video, Handling the Power Crawl, the, the presenter says, quote, none of this power level shit means anything if your characters suck or the conflict is contrived. So, like, yes, characters are the heart of it and then they even go on to compare like who cares that ang's shooting out beams of light from his face when you've got like the last agni kai going on at the same time with uh, azula and zuko and that fight had so many more stakes because of the like personal element of it between them so with korra the fighting doesn't really mean shit. It's about where her headspace is. I actually happen to think book one is one of the weakest in regards to this because it kind of was more focused on when is she going to master airbending and what is she going to do about this antagonist with this very specific power. With book, that got destroyed in book two. That was the whole point. She got Rava ripped out of her, right? So she no longer was the avatar for a little bit. And the whole point was that she was able to connect with herself and find that power inside of herself. It wasn't like this set goal for her to reach. It was just what needed to happen for her to sort of like be in touch and connect. Then in book three, the antagonists they had for her were incredibly powerful. I mean, we had an airbender finally using airbending aggressively, which is the most OP thing possible because you know we saw what he did to the earth queen and all of that so it was never like you know there's this oh uh, now she's just got all this power of a god and it's so stupid she'll never use it like no when she wasn't holding back and going all super sane in that final book three fight it was still fairly evenly matched remember janora and the other airbenders had to create the tornado to help bring zaheer down maybe if uh Korra hadn't been poisoned from within she would have been able to bring zaheer down but he was also just trying to contain her and it was more that the fight was like very personal to Korra. She didn't know what they wanted with her. She was really frustrated trying to figure that out. And she, you know, at the same time, she just kind of ripped open this new spiritual age and she's like, this is the reality of the world I created, but she didn't know really how to do it. So the whole point of book three was just like, how do I define myself now that I'm not a bridge between it, now that I don't have 10,000 years of structure in between it and, and you know, patterns to go back on and, and past lives to guide me. What is my role? So she kind of thought she found it with rebuilding the Air Nation and she committed herself to it. And she ended up, you know, again getting dragged through the ringer just kind of fucking horribly because of these really just random antagonists with this laser focus on her for something she didn't fully understand. So when... You know, you then go into book four, she's at like her lowest point, but it's on a, it's not just on a physical level, it's also on a philosophical level for her and for her identity. When she runs away and is hiding and like, I'm not the avatar, I wouldn't know, you know, I get that a lot, I, that I look like her, but I wouldn't know what happened to her. She's 
truly lost. And it's not just like, oh, Rob is missing. It's, it's, she doesn't understand what she can be. And, and it's not really until she faces down Kuvira and it had, Kuvira is just a foil for her, right? Kuvira is all about, like, like, yeah, there's the external Kuvira, um, concentration camps or re-education camps, I'm sorry. Uh, re-education camps, fascism, and, Bayfong family trauma that's going on and that that matters but it's completely secondary to how Cora is viewing Kuvira and that's an extension of herself that's looking back to at a time when she was acting out of position of insecurity and when she was so scared to like lose any sort of control and she's seeing these terrible ends Kuvira is going to, to to do that and where she ends up coming to is like kind of realizing it's okay that I'm going to be out of control and that's that's the whole Zahir um let it play out, right? That's I mean, that's cognitive behavioral therapy for uh any kind of anxiety and certainly for PTSD. It, it's like let it play out. The only way out is through. It's this sort of it's like an immersion therapy kind of thing. So so the point of Cora was always her headspace. And Bright kind of they said they had her spiritual arc planned out, but I do feel like they sort of stumbled a little bit into the ending. And I don't just mean Cora Sami. I mean, specifically ending Cora on the like, it's okay. Like I've learned from my experiences and I'm ready for more and I can come at this. I'm always going to try to bring balance to the world. I think that note of sort of quiet, peaceful contemplation, I can't, I don't feel like that was the ending they would have planned, you know, given that the ending of book one was like, yeah, I restored Bandango Me and all that, and all that stuff. So I don't, I don't know. Um, it's, it's a good video. I just think looking at the physical fighting and the power levels and being like, oh man, Korra is too powerful. She just broke everything. And, and now the Avatar state is a booster rocket. Like, yeah, you know, that's, that's sort of a natural consequence of continuing on in this universe. And, then book two had literally the highest stakes possible, but they needed to do that because then book two ripped everything apart and that paved the way for book three and book four, which was most explicitly about that internal journey. And the the value of Legend of Gore really comes from that. The external stuff is sort of secondary. Um, in some ways it would work better as a novel, but it's it's absolutely fantastic and I will defend it to my dying day even though like yeah some of the power stuff is is a little i i do agree it it wasn't the world building was not as tight or as planned but in some ways i think it's those flaws that really make everything else shine anyway because yeah you you shouldn't be picking that apart it's just oh i love this show Okay. I don't know how to end this. That was, those were just my thoughts. You can see why typing it out probably would have been a little weird because it would have just been rambling and rambling. And, eh. uh, Gretchen and I really do need to write that piece in Cora's healing arc. That's something that we've uh, had in the pipeline for a while, so maybe we'll have time this month to do so. Anyway, that's about all. Uh, please still send me asks. I am around. I can try to bestir myself to answer some of them. And hopefully I can finally get to writing the definitive ranking of book one episodes. I need to rip apart Endgame because it's that bad. Uh, yeah, other than that, I will talk to you guys next time. Bye. Oh, by the way, there's this part of the video where he's like, okay, talking about characters being planks of wood. And then it's like, now is the perfect time to transition and talk about Korra. And it's like, I mean, you're entitled to your opinion, your terrible wrong opinion.